Welcome. Who are you? My name is Amina. I come from a long line of people who've passed on our history from generation to generation for hundreds of years. You've selected the history of black peoples of the Americas as a very large group. What do you want to know? I want to find out about people like me. I mean, I'm British, and I know that my grandparents came from the Caribbean. And my granddad told me that his ancestors came from somewhere else. So I want to know where they came from and why. What's their history? Your search starts over here, about 4,000 miles from the Caribbean in Africa. This is where some of your ancestors came from hundreds of years ago. Africa is a vast continent. Different groups of people lived here, leading different lives. In some parts of Africa, people led very simple lives, and in others, they built up large empires. What would you like to look at? Great Zimbabwe. This is what's left of one of the great African empires. The Shona people lived around here. There was a lot of gold here, which made it a very rich area. There were trade routes across Africa. People bought and sold ivory, leather, spices, gold, cloth, pottery, precious stones. They also bought people who were sold as slaves. Arabic traders came from the north, Indian traders from the east, and European traders from the west. Your ancestors probably came from the west coast of Africa, since this is where many Caribbean people came from. Many different groups of people lived here. Gao is one of the finest towns of Africa. It is also one of the biggest. It is full of people buying things. Everything is rich and magnificent. In Timbuktu, there are many shops selling fine cloth. Here are also many doctors, judges, priests, and other clever men. The horses are all very big and strong and move much faster than ours. Groups of traders come to Timbuktu from every part of the world. Ghana is very large, with several markets. It has fine houses and solid buildings. In Benin, the kings are extremely powerful and are worshipped by their people. Benin was a large kingdom. The people of Benin were skilled workers in wood and metal and produced many great works of art. Can I speak to someone? Who's this? Olada Equiano, born in 1745. He wrote his life story. Much of our information about this period comes from accounts by white people. So this is an important source. I come from a place called Libo. My village is in a small valley. Life is quiet. Most people around here spend all their time farming, except when there's something to celebrate. Then there'll be plenty of music and dancing and poetry. I like that. Everybody has to make a new show up with their dance. It could be about something happy or something sad. It has to be a true story about something that has just happened. So the stories 
are always new. West Africa. This is where your ancestors came from. An estimated 11 million people were taken by force to North America, to South America, and to the Caribbean. Why? Why were they taken? They were taken to be used as slaves. They were bought mainly by European traders. European traders had been trading with Africa for hundreds of years. In 1492, things changed. For the first time, the Europeans found out that there were other lands, lands they hadn't known about, that they could reach by sailing west to the continent we call America. When the Europeans went to America, they saw they could grow things that people would pay high prices for, such as cotton, tobacco, and sugar. If only they could find enough labor to work the land. <laughs> this is why they enslaved people from Africa. Why did they use African people? Why not European people? They did. There just weren't enough European settlers nor were there enough of the people who already lived in the islands. In Jamaica, for example, when Columbus first came, there were 60,000 Arawaks living there. 150 years later, they had been almost wiped out. Can I see somebody? Yes. I can reconstruct one of the original people for you. My people are almost all dead. We welcomed these people and in return they made slaves of us. We get nothing, not even enough food. My father died of starvation. My brother fell sick with a strange disease they brought with them. Some of my family died fighting them, but they have guns and we have none. If we refuse to work, they punish us. They've taken everything we have, even our lives. The African people brought over as slaves were not as badly affected by these diseases. So from the Europeans' point of view, it was a good idea to bring more and more African people across. So, was this the beginning of slavery? No. Slavery already existed in many places all over the world before this, not just in Africa. But the Europeans now encouraged the trade in Africa to grow. This gave them the labor they needed. The first people had been taken to the Americas as slaves at the beginning of the 16th century. Once the land was cleared and farms established, there was a great demand for slave labor. The so-called triangular trade grew up. Europeans sailed first to West Africa to trade goods for slaves. The slaves were shipped to America on the second part of the triangle. On the plantations, they grew the fashionable products, which were brought back to Europe to be sold at a good profit. Sugar was used to sweeten drinks and food. Tobacco smoking also became very popular. In 1750, 10,000 tons of sugar came from Jamaica. By 1800, it was 2 million tons. This sugar was grown by the slave labor of African people and their descendants. So how did people become slaves? Anyone who could be captured became a slave. Sometimes there were prisoners of war, but usually there were just ordinary people who were kidnapped.
Europeans didn't usually capture the people they took as slaves. They paid African people to do it for them. Being a slave trader became a profitable business. Everyone had gone off to work in the fields. My sister and me, we were playing. Two men and a woman grabbed us and took us off into the forest. I cried and I refused to eat for days, but they forced food into my mouth. I was taken through so many lands of Africa. And about six or seven months after I had been kidnapped, we arrived at the sea coast. I found out afterwards that everyone who was captured ended up here, but sometimes they'd walk for hundreds of miles to get here. From wherever they were captured, they would be forced to war. I don't understand. Why did African people do this to other African people? We're only talking about a few people. There were powerful kingdoms in Africa, and some of these rulers were prepared to sell their neighbors in return for the riches they gained especially guns and gunpowder. This arms trade encouraged African people to fight each other. At the coast, we were kept there for a long time in prisons they called barracoons. There were so many people there, all speaking their own languages. I felt lonely. I miss my family. I wanted to go home. Men, women, boys, girls, all slept in the same place. It wasn't right. They kept us like this for a long time. Then one day, men came and we were taken out. They looked us over and some of us were made to go with them onto a very big ship. What happened then? I was put down under the decks. The air stank. I wanted to die. There were so many people crammed into the hole that no one could move. The chains on my wrists and ankles rubbed my skin to the bone. It was very dirty. And many people died. This was the middle passage. It took between six and 12 weeks. Inside the hold of the ship, they were kept in filthy conditions. It was a perfect breeding ground for disease. How could they stand it? Some of them couldn't. But others found ways to survive and even to resist what was happening to them. Helen! Helen! Shackles are free! Huh? They're always on guard. If we give them the slightest chance, they'll try to take over the ship. We had to keep them in chains till we saw the land in the Caribbean. Otherwise, they would have killed us. Whenever they get a chance, they will fight hard and will not give in. They are desperate and will do anything for freedom. Did anyone get away? It was very unlikely. The odds were too high. Only a small percentage were taken to North America. Most were taken to South America or to the islands in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, the first stop was usually Barbados because that was the first island the ships reached. After many weeks, we came near to the island of Barbados. The whites on board seemed very happy, and as the seashore got closer, we saw the harbour and lots of other ships. How did you feel? Very scared. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. A lot of strange men came on board, and they looked at us. They even made us jump and they pointed to the land like they were telling us to go there. 
I thought I might be eaten by these ugly men. After that, we were all put down under the deck again. I was still very scared. What happened then? We were sold. After a few days, we were taken off the ship and we were all pushed into a space and white men looked at us from the edge of the circle. They waited until they heard a drumbeat and then they rushed into the yard where we were and chose who they wanted. It was very frightening to be pulled about and shouted at. Sometimes you saw mothers being sold separately from their children and wives being sold separately from their husbands. They weren't likely to see each other again. That's really awful. Yes, it is. When people were sold, they also lost their names. No one bothered to use people's own African names. Equiano was renamed Gustavus Vassa by the man who bought him. And he was known by that name for many years. But when he wrote his autobiography, he deliberately chose to use his African name, Olauda Equiano. Most people were given a European name that suited their new masters. That must have added to the sadness and anger that people felt. So this could have been one of my ancestors, ending up in a strange land, no family, no friends, not even your own name. It is true that they came without any physical possessions. No money, no shoes, no weapons, no books. But they did bring their memories of their own cultures with them. What do you mean? People hung on to their own ways of doing things. Their African languages, their stories, their religions, their music, and their skills. They didn't arrive empty-handed. African culture arrived in the Americas at the same time as the slave ships. So if one of my ancestors did get sold as a slave, what would they have done? What their lives were like varied, depending upon what kind of work they did. Remember, we're talking about millions of people. Every one of them had a different life. All they had in common was that once they were captured, they were slaves and worked without pay all their lives. Most people worked on plantations like this one. They were not like farms in Europe, growing food for local people to eat. They just grew one crop, which was sent away to be sold for profit. In the Caribbean, that crop was sugar, 
and growing it was very hard work. So what was it like? The written and visual records we have give us different bits of the story. We haven't got a full life history of anyone who was a field hand, but from the various sources we do have, I can reconstruct what life might have been like for someone. I'm Betty Newton. I'm a field hand. I started work in the field when I was about four years old, when I could help with fetching water for the others. As I got older, I moved into the third gang, tending cattle and weeding. Now I'm in the first gang. I horse soil, I dig drain, I cut and bundle cane at harvest time. I carry basket of manure to the fields. I work from before sunrise to nightfall with about half an hour to eat. At busy times like harvesting, that means 16 hours in the field. The baby often wants food, but sometimes the overseer won't let me feed him because it slowed down my work. When I come home, I make food for my family. My husband John works in the sugar factory. We grow our own food, look after our animals, and cut wood for cooking. Like Betty, didn't have much time to look after their children. Men and women in the first field gangs did the same hard, heavy work until they were too old and worn out, when they would go back to the second and third gangs to lighter work. They would still work the same long hours. Can you show me? This is a plan of a typical plantation. What would you like to look at? These are the cane fields where Betty would have worked. The young cane has to be hoed regularly to keep it free from weeds. This is back-breaking work. Sometimes the sun beats down for hours. Other times it rain hard, but we still have to carry on. Once it's grown, it has to be harvested. First of all, the cane is burned. Doesn't that damage the cane? No, the fire is just to burn off all the leaves and makes it easier for us to get between the rows and cut the cane. Then we cut it. We work in pairs. We cut together up each row of cane, hacking at the lowest part of the cane, then trimming it and throwing it down behind us. When the cane is being cut, I have to work very long days. We start as soon as it's light enough and carry on all day, row after row. It's hard work and goes on for many weeks. Then the cane is taken to the factory. At the factory, it's washed and then chopped and crushed. This is what squeezes out the cane juice. The juice is where the sugar is. The juice is boiled and distilled, and the sugar crystals begin to form. The boiling vats are open-topped, and the boiling sugar has to be stirred by hand. This is a dangerous job. Sometimes people get terrible burns from boiling sugar. When all the moisture has been removed, sugar is what's left. So what else would people have done? 
What happened over here? This is the plantation owner's house. Wow, very nice. Yes, and these fine buildings were built by the enslaved people of the Caribbean. I think I'd rather work here than in the fields. There were some advantages to working in the house. My daughter Mary works up at the plantation house, serving food to the master and the mistress. She has to get up very early to get the fires going and start breakfast. And she often doesn't finish until after dinner has been eaten and the washing up been done. It's a very long day, but she gets better food and sometimes she gets given things by the mistress. I'm glad to think she does an easier job than I do. But working so close to the owners means that she has to put up with their moods. At least in the fields we're away from that most of the time. They don't bother coming down to the fields very often. They just leave us to the overseers. What's an overseer? He's in charge of the work. He keeps us in line, makes sure we keep at it. The overseers could be poor white immigrants or promoted slaves. They had many more privileges than the ordinary slaves. Most of them are a bit too fond of the whip when it comes to keeping order. They like to throw their weight around. Some of them are worse than others when it comes to handing out the punishments. The best jobs on this plantation are usually given to the men. My son Samuel is a driver for Mr. Newton, the owner. He gets to see a lot of places and gets to hear a lot of news. He has to be very careful and not upset the master. Once, he was almost put back in the field because he was late getting back. I don't want him to end up in the field. It's hard work and there's not much chance of improving yourself. But in his position, he even gets to make a little money sometimes doing extra job for people. I thought slaves didn't get paid. They didn't. Slaves were given food, shelter and clothing. But they got no wages. So how does your son make money? Well, we grow our own food. And sometimes there's a little extra left over. My boy Samuel, he take it and sell it to the sailors who come into the docks whenever he's down there. And if he isn't going on a trip, there's always the market. From the plantations, the busy marketeers came from every direction. They had sweet potatoes, yams, corn, fruits and berries, vegetables, nuts, cakes. Here was one woman with a small black pig under her arm. Another girl had a brood of chickens. Other people made money through the work they did for their owners, like Colauda Equian. He acted as a clerk for his master, and he managed to use his time to buy and sell things to make money. He was one of the people who made enough money to buy their freedom. Well? 40 pounds sterling. I have always known you to be a man of your word. And did you not say that 40 pounds would buy my freedom? How many people bought the freedom then? Only a few. It cost a lot of money, as much as 200 pounds. And plantation owners didn't want to lose their fittest and most hardworking slaves. This is what one observer said. Some slaves live in comfort and have plenty to eat, 
But most slaves, the field slaves, are treated more like beasts of burden than like human beings.